The next speaker is uh, Manuel Andres from Caltech. He will give us the talk about the quantum science with tweezer arrays. Please. Okay, a second. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. And the screening sharing also works. Okay, so we'll do that. Okay, so let me know if something's not working on a technical end. Okay, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to give a talk in this uh, wonderful conference. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the uh, results over the past few years uh, based on a new platform for neutral atoms uh, that be you know a sample using tweezer arrays. Um, broadly speaking, this research is situated in experimental quantum science, and there's many different you know uh, systems and platforms, and we work with cold atomic systems. And I find it interesting that these platforms share a set of uh, common goals. So many of us want to build quantum computers. I'm also particularly interested in studying many-body physics, sometimes called quantum simulation. Uh, some of the uh, historic mainstays of atomic physics has been uh, quantum metrology, that is to use quantum systems for precision measurement, and now in particular also entangled systems somehow uh, along the lines of what Monica described to a certain degree. And uh, eventually we really want to uh, hook up all these systems in a, in a quantum fashion to make them large and uh, to create interconnects. Um, now the goal for all of this is in a sense to really outperform classical counterparts of these systems. And the key ingredient for that is in most cases, large scale entanglement. And I think this is really, um, uh, the most challenging aspect of this research, and, and I'll illustrate in a second why I think this is the case. Um, so to really illustrate this, imagine that you have a series of uh, qubits uh, that have a state zero and one in an array. And now, um, uh, assume we have uh, short range interactions and we would do uh, schematically a series of two qubit entanglement gates or entangling operations. So you can grow and entangle states by adding basically uh, states to that. And then what you would see is that you can grow a large scale entangled system, but um, the, the structure of that state grows uh, linearly in, in space time. So you see a, a sort of light cone structure here. And um, so one take home message from that is that if you really with short range interactions with this typical in these systems, um, want to grow a large scale entangled system that uh, spans the whole experimental system size, the time you need to build up entanglement increases with system size, specifically with the linear dimension of the system. So that's important to, uh, to remember. At the same time, also your probability to make an error in each of these steps uh, is higher. So the probability for an error per time strap also increases with system size. So the more qubits I have here, the more decoherence events I can have. Um, and in a sense, if you really want to scale up these systems, just uh, just from a fundamental perspective, you're going to be hit twice. So once it takes you longer to actually grow an entangled state, and at the same time, your error probability per time step also increases with system size. So this is actually why this is so hard to grow large-scale entangled states. And I think this is, uh, to a certain degree, the most fundamental problem in quantum science. At the same time, it is uh, technically hard to scale up while maintaining control over individual uh, spins and systems. So that's an engineering problem. And in a sense, this is, to me, um, in a nutshell, uh, really why uh, quantum science in the sense of reaching uh, non-classical systems that, that really can outperform uh, classical systems uh, is hard. Um, and my talk is about how we can address these challenges uh, with new techniques for controlling uh, individual neutral atoms. And um, I'll walk you through briefly to an outline. Um, so I'll talk about optical tweezers and, and atom by atom assembly, how we can assemble large scale defect free arrays now. I'll talk a little bit about rootback interactions, which we use to generate entanglement. And then I'll walk you through a few uh, results from our lab at Caltech uh, concerning uh, alkaline earth atoms in tweezer arrays, uh, starting from narrow line cooling and ending with a quantum uh, simulation results that are pretty preliminary. And I'll wrap up with an outlook. Let me first introduce uh, briefly um, um, the people who really do the hard work at the experiment. This is a range of graduate students and postdocs. Uh, some 
uh, are responsible for the results I'll show and, and, and were responsible and some moved on to their own groups now. We have theory collaborators and we also have uh, experimental collaborators at the Chat Propulsion Lab in Caltech. And I also want to thank the Harvard team uh, at, uh, at Misha's group uh, where I show some of the data still from my postdoc. Um, we are always looking for new members. Um, if you're interested, uh, write me an email. We have uh, usually openings on all levels for uh, highly qualified candidates. I should also say that Jake, uh, who was a postdoc in my group and now moved on to his, start his own group at Urbana-Champagne is also hiring and he has some very exciting projects that he's looking uh, to hire for. Okay, um, I'll start out with optical tweezers and atom by atom assembly, pretty uh, basic. So what is an optical tweezer? So that's a tightly focused laser beam uh, micrometer extension here. And in principle, you can trap one atom in that in that tweezer beam. Uh, you load it from a magneto optical trap and it has been shown already in the early 2000s that there's a process in that loading that prevents double occupancy. That's a light assisted uh, collisional process. So typically these tweezers are then filled with zero or one atoms, uh, one atom if you do everything right. Now we are interested in large scale tweezer arrays and uh, there's essentially two techniques uh, for creating these arrays. One is uh, spatial light modulators and the other one is acousto-optic deflectors. I'll explain acousto-optic deflectors. Um, essentially, you have an incoming laser beam that is diffracted by an RF uh, wave that travels through a crystal. And, and this uh, RF wave controls the diffraction angle with its frequency and the uh, diffraction efficiency with its intensity. Intensity. Now, if you have multiple RF tones, you can basically generate multiple diffracted spots where each RF tone controls uh, the, the, basically the angle of a single beam and the intensity of a single beam. And you can basically control the whole array by RF engineering. And now if you cross two acoustic optical deflectors, you get diffract uh, diffraction in two directions and you can create this two-dimensional arrays here. So here's a picture of um, the optical light. So there's an empty tweezer array uh, generated with acoustic optical deflectors. And this is a thousand, a hundred by hundred sites, so 10,000 sites. So you see this is actually quite nice and, and scalable in principle to this uh, large sizes. The tricky part is to actually fill it. Um, so here's an example of that. So um, in experiment, what we do is we load these arrays from a magneto-optical trap. Then we basically throw away the magneto-optical trap. So that's a cold cloud of atoms. And then image atoms in the tweezer array with fluorescence image uh, imaging. And then we record images like this. And then we repeat the whole process from scratch. And you see a series of images like this, where each image basically have a different configuration. And this again comes from the stochastic loading with zero or one atom per tweezer. If you average these images, it looks quite nice. So you see a, a picture like this. But what you really want is to see something like this in a single shot, in a single repetition. So how do you really get to defect-free arrays in a single shot? So this is a technique that we use now to reach that goal. And it's called atom by atom assembly. The idea is to stick a tweezer array into a magneto-optical trap, let the mod disperse. Uh, image the array, identify uh, empty tweezers and switch them off, and then reshuffle all the full tweezers into a compact array. Um, here's a video of uh, atomic signals uh, before and after rearrangement. So here you see the stochastic filling in 100 uh, tweezer array in 1D, and then we uh, shuffle everything to the left. So you see basically disordered and ordered array. And um, we can vary the geometries uh, from shot to shot. So this is a pair array, and then you can make uh, arrays of uh, seven atoms, for example. Um, so this is uh, flexible in the geometric arrangements. Um, I don't want to say too much about this and just want to summarize uh, this atom or atom assembly technique, which is now used in uh, various labs uh, over the world. Um, this was first uh, published in, uh, in a paper by myself and colleagues from, from Harvard during my postdoc at Anto Ans group. And then now there's a few more groups uh, working on uh, various variations of this technique. Uh, in summary, usually you get defect free arrays of around 50 atoms or maybe a little bit more now in 1D, 2D, and quasi 3D. With quasi 3D, it means you can have layered systems that extend to a certain degree in the third direction, but not as much as in the other two directions. Um, the atomic distances in the arrays are adjustable from one micrometer to about 100 micrometer. The geometries are flexible. You can dial them in essentially from shot to shot. And it's a much faster repetition rate compared to traditional cold atom experiments. So typically here, the repetition rate is 100 milliseconds compared to 
10 seconds or up to a minute in, in traditional cold atom experiments. So these are some sort of the features. There are some limits. Of course, that's the number of traps you can make with a, a which are deep enough to actually trap atoms. So this is a laser power limitation in a sense. And then also the total success probability of this rearrangement process. And I should say this scales exponentially um, in the single atom rearrangement probability. What do I mean with that? If I try to transport an atom from A to B, I first have to identify it correctly. So I need extremely high uh, detection fidelity. And, and, and also I want to make sure that the atom is still there after the image. And then I want to transport it correctly from A to B. And this combination of identifying it correctly and, and survival fidelity in the image and then transport fidelity, I call single atom rearrangement probability. And now the probability to really have a defect-free array of n atoms without any holes that I correctly assembled scales with p to the n. So that means that p has to be high in order to go to high ends with high success probability. And also sometimes when people quote numbers for defect-free arrays, you should always ask, what is your total success probability? Because in principle, you can go to quite high numbers, but at very low success probability. It means you have to repeat the, uh, the, the rearrangement uh, more often to actually get something defect-free. OK, so in, this is a, a nice scheme to really basically uh, get to an array of atoms with, that I can use for all these purposes that I listed in the beginning. Um, but to really do something meaningful with them, I need interaction. So these distances are too large for the atoms to interact in a meaningful way because they're neutral. Um, what are interaction mechanisms? You can let them tunnel via Hubbard interactions. You can use long-range interactions, for example, uh, mediated by photons in the cavity. Or you can have dipole-dipole interactions, for example, mediated by Rydberg states or by molecules uh, uh, trapped in these tweezers. So I'll, I'll work with Rydberg states and I'll explain this in a second. Um, Rydberg interactions and their limits. Um, so uh, what do I mean with a Rydberg state? So normally, if you have an atom in its electronic ground state, the electronic uh, wave function of its outer electron is quite small. Now, if you go to a very high principal quantum number, the size of the electronic wave function can be extremely large. As a main consequence is, uh, this electronic wave function is easily polarizable. And uh, this leads in particular to strong induced dipole-dipole uh, interaction actions that scale with a distance uh, 1 over R6. And uh, the prefactor here, the so-called C6 coefficient, scales with the quantum number to the power of 11. So it's a quite uh, a drastic scaling. Uh, to give you a, a few numbers, for n equals 70, you can have about 10 gigahertz at 2 micrometer distance, or 1 megahertz at 10 micrometer distance. Um, so in particular, these numbers you have here, they're extremely well matched with, with these tweezer array distances. So the interaction rel range is suited to the typical atomic distances that I can uh, rearrange in these tweezers. And this is one reason why this has been such a fruitful marriage. Um, to go into a little bit more detail, so typically you have atoms in this arrays, and then each of these atoms forms a two-level system in this ground state to Rydberg state transition. Uh, then you have a laser with a certain frequency that is the tune from that Rydberg state, and this laser has a certain rubbish frequency uh, that controls how fast you can drive it. Now you can map this essentially to a spin system, sigma C operators projector on R minus G and corresponding sigma X operator. And then if you have a non-interacting array, you basically see a very similar, uh, simple Hamiltonian here in a, in a rotating frame where this is... Uh, the, the Rabi frequency controls the sigma x and the detuning controls the sigma c term. Now, with interactions, you get an additional term here that's of icing time. Uh, in particular, you have a projector only on Rydberg states. Only these Rydberg states are strongly interacting with this 1 over 6 dipole-dipole, uh, induced dipole-dipole interaction, and the ground states are uh, non-interacting uh, within the precision of the Hamiltonian. Um, now, with the atom by atom assembly, I can basically uh, construct this interaction matrix in a pairwise fashion, and I can tune how large these coefficients are by orders of magnitude, as I showed you earlier. So I can basically dial in a VIJ matrix from shot to shot and basically control this term. And then I have the laser control uh, over these terms in the front. And if you do a bit more uh, complicated tricks, you can also make a local control here. So, but I'll only talk about the global case here. OK, now the physics of this Hamiltonian, so it's a spin model, essentially, um, is quite rich. So here I showed a phase diagram, or so approximate phase diagram, 
for the ground states in a 1D uh, equally spaced array. And you can see there's various different ordered phases, so-called Rookback uh, crystals, a disordered phase, and then different types of quantum phase transitions and different types of line uh, describing certain uh, dynamical uh, behavior. Uh, so the physics is quite rich, and it comes from an interplay of uh, quantum effects, long-range interactions, and the geometry here. Um, the ground states in 1D are complicated, but I think known mostly. So I'll refer you to a paper here by Leuchli, uh, which has, I think, the most precise description of this physics. And uh, 2D already, the ground state physics is not much known quantitatively. Um, there's extremely uh, rich uh, non-equilibrium behavior here, uh, like from uh, conformal field theories to integrable lines, uh, confinement effects, chaotic regimes. So you can find pretty much everything in here. Um, and in, in more generally, this Hamiltonian is a rich toolbox for quantum simulation information and also metrology, as I will come back to in the end, if you have a bit more control. Um, so there has been a remarkable progress in this direction, um, but I think we have only seen the tip of the iceberg uh, for a certain Experimental papers, I'll refer you to these uh, references here. I don't want to go into detail about the history now of what has been seen this Hamilton, and I want to talk about their uh, limitations in more detail. So what are really the limitations of this? Um, so fundamentally, you have a coherence time limitation that comes from the Rydberg state lifetime uh, that you can basically not beat. In alkali atoms, typically this G to R transition goes via two photon excitation, and then you get a mixture from this intermediate state, which is typically very short lived. It gives you an effective lifetime reduction to about 50 microseconds in a typical regime. Um, additionally, these atoms, they basically are not at zero temperature, so they actually move. So that gives you a finer temperature effect, and essentially a Toppler shift on this direction, uh, on this transition. And um, importantly, uh, also laser noise plays, in, uh, plays a role here. So we, in the past years, we have really found out like uh, what limits are there. So it's a combination of amplitude and phase noise uh, in these lasers that you really have to work with the whole time. So these are typically the limitations in terms of coherence time. There's another time scale that is important. That's what I call the trap of time. So typically, these experiments are done in free flight. So we prepare atoms in the tweezers, we switch off the tweezers, and then on that time scale of uh, the tweezer of time, we do all these Rydberg experiments and then we trap them again afterwards. The reason for this is that the Rydberg states are typically extremely strongly anti-trapped and this leads to additional defacing. So it's actually better to do it in free flight, typically. And the time scale you have for that free flight experiments is typically a few tens of microseconds or 10 microseconds uh, for alkali temperatures. And um, this you have to compare to achievable Rabi frequencies. That's the lowest energy scale in the Hamiltonian. And typically, this is a one to maybe a few megahertz in alkali atoms. So this gives you some sort of the number of operations in a way you can do in, in arrays like this. Uh, there's additional limitations for system size and atom detection fidelities uh, for rootback atoms. Um, so this is some sort of a summary of, of, of uh, the basically the, the physical limits of this of the setups. Um, what we do at Caltech now is ask the following questions. Is, so can we potentially improve on some of these uh, limitations by using alkaline earth atoms? And are there uh, maybe even qualitatively different applications? Uh, so the idea here is to really use alkaline earth atoms now. Um, most of the experiments in the past were with alkali atoms. And alkaline earth atoms have two valence electrons, and they're typically used in optical clock. And the reason for this is that uh, they have uh, ultra narrow transitions here that the dipole forbidden typically, and they have metastable states. And um, for us, what also plays an important role that these atoms have narrow optical transitions in strontium here, uh, you have a seven kilohertz line, and then they also have broad transitions. So we'll make use of this level structure for this tweezer physics. So the idea is really to generate arrays of individually controlled alkaline earth atoms and to use them for quantum science. I should say there were parallel developments uh, to what we did at Caltech uh, at Chiller and also in Princeton, and some of the papers are overlapping. And there's, of course, also previous work with uh, optical lattice systems with quantum gas microscopes with the terbium, uh, for example, in, in, in two Japanese groups. I'll walk you through a few key results here that we achieved at Adams at, Al uh, at, at, at Caltech uh, concerning narrow line cooling, very high fidelity imaging, a new uh, Rydberg excitation scheme, and some preliminary results for 
uh, quantum simulation. And for the experts, the results are all with strontium 88, which has no nuclear spin. Uh, let me start with narrow line cooling. I think this is one of the nicest features. Um, so we use the seven kilohertz uh, broad line. And the important fact here is that this kilohertz at uh, this line basically resolves the motional spectrum of atoms in the tweezer. So the harmonic level spacing here typically is about 100 kilohertz. So you can resolve it. So you can basically do single photon sideband cooling. There's a typical uh, sideband spectrum. What you see is a very strong asymmetry indicating very high ground state population here. We use a second cooling scheme as well. And this happens in a specific scenario where the excited state has a different trapping potential from the ground state. Uh, here, as an example, excited state is stronger trapped. And what you should really remember here is that the energy scales for this tweezer trapping are in the megahertz regime. So this distance is megahertz-ish. Uh, but the line width here is only 7 kilohertz. That means I can basically decide in a situation like this where in the tweezer I want to excite an atom. So here, for the schooling scheme, we tune the uh, uh, resonance conditions such that we are um, exciting atoms at the bottom of the tweezer only. So what happens here, an atom rolls down, it gets excited and rolls up a steeper uh, potential and then gets de-excited again. And this is a textbook Sisyphus uh, mechanism that we observe. That's a, some sort of a poor man's picture. There's a quantum mechanical version of this that has more predictability, uh, but I don't have enough time to really explain this here. Um, what we find is that the Sisyphus cooling in particular is extremely robust, and that's what we use as our uh, uh, typical cooling scheme. And it also brings us pretty close to the emotional ground state. And this is important um, that we are that cold in the end, uh, and I'll show you how cold we are in a second, for root by coherence because of the Doppler shift, for imaging fidelity, and also for clock line control. Um, so how do we image? Um, Imaging works the following way. So we cool on this on this seven kilohertz line to keep the atoms cold in the tweezer, essentially in order to prevent loss. And at the same time, we shine in a laser that's resonant on this 30 megahertz blue transition, and then we collect fluorescence light uh, on that blue transition. So this is a typical image of a single shot in an array, and then this is averaged uh, over all these images. So these look quite, uh, quite clean. If you look into more details, you can look at basically the photon counting statistics in a box around an atom here, and then you see uh, that you get two clearly distinguished peaks for no atom and one atom you can basically via thresholding uh, identify and one atom with high accuracy. If you would plot this further, this would be flat, so there's no peak for two atoms in our case. Uh, in terms of numbers, we use, uh, we use a fidelity, or well, reach a fidelity of four nines approximately. That's the accuracy with which I can distinguish one atom from zero atom. Uh, another important number is the survival probability, this is the um, probability for having an atom left after the imaging process. So there's loss during that process. The key for that were really long lifetimes and good cooling. Um, so in particular, under cooling, we reach uh, about seven minutes lifetime now in these tweezer arrays, which is actually uh, uh, maybe an order of magnitude longer than previous experiments, or even more. Um, and so this is some sort of uh, what we reach. And the things, this, these numbers are important now for large scale atom by atom assembly. So in particular, again, this is exponential. In P, P is the single atom rearrangement fidelity and one element of P is basically these two numbers, the product of these numbers. So I have to have these numbers high in order to actually do this rearrangement successfully. And now in terms of just the imaging and survival fidelity, you could imagine really pushing this large scale atom by atom assembly to thousands of atoms with a reasonable overall success probability. And it's some one of the goals of the upcoming years. Um, at the same time, having high uh, imaging fidelity is also important for debugging uh, quantum operations. Okay. Um, let me move forward and explain you uh, how uh, our Rydberg scheme and some uh, results for that. Um, so the Rydberg scheme is really different to alkali atoms. And uh, uh, the way we do this is the following. So atoms typically start in the absolute ground state down here. And then uh, we transfer them to the metastable state, that's the excited state in this ultra narrow clock transition with single atom a clock state control. So it's a, mainly a coherent transfer. And then we're in this metastable state here. Okay. Uh, the way we do this is described in a, a paper down here where we show also how we can use this to build an atomic clock. And there's parallel results in Adam Kaufman's group for this uh, clock state control. I don't have enough time to explain this in detail in the 30 minutes I have. But just believe me that we can move the atoms in uh, if being cold from S to G. And then once you're in G for the Rydberg physics that I described earlier, you can forget about this ground state. And now you have a two level transition left where you can go from a P state here to an S Rydberg state 
in a single photon transition. So you basically skip that intermediate state that you usually have in, in alkali atoms. And this is a very convenient wavelength for many purposes. And now uh, there's a few key features here. You can actually go to extremely large, uh, not extremely, but somewhat large Rabi frequencies because you have high power here and you avoid that intermediate state. That intermediate state would normally also cause decoherence and we don't have that here. Atoms are very cold. So we have typical N bar in the radial direction of 0.25 that reduces Doppler effect. We have a new detection scheme. Uh, so in the following data uh, uh, that I will show, we detect this Rydberg state with an outer ionization scheme. I don't have enough time to explain it, but just believe me, it's extremely high detection fidelity that's actually quite a bit higher than the, the original schemes used in alkali atoms. And the Rydberg states can in principle also be trapped via the ion core. So this object here, when you have when I show R, what it is, you have two valence electrons. One stays close to the core and the other one goes into a Rydberg level. And, uh, and the core together with the leftover electron forms a strontium plus ion. That strontium plus ion you can trap in principle. And the same holds, for example, for terbium. And this has been shown by Jeff Thompson in terbium that you can actually trap the Rydberg states, which is nice. Um, how about some results? So what we did first is essentially rearrange atoms into a spacing where they are non-interacting and to just look at plain vanilla Rabi oscillations. So non-interacting uh, at large distances and then that the tuning is set to zero. And we see a graph like this. So once you see one, you're basically in G and zero basically indicates that you're in R. So you see basically textbook Rabi oscillations on that transition, and this is some sort of the long time limit. Um, I should say this are the first Rydberg Rabi oscillations that have been observed with alkaline earth atoms. The Rabi frequencies we reach are 6 to 15 megahertz, depending on exactly how we scale things. Uh, the bipulse fidelity to go to basically to R is around 99.5, and this is without correcting for preparation detection errors, which is also nice. And we observe here around 40 oscillation cycles. Uh, we have some newer data where this is more closer to 60, actually. Um, so this is also nice. So the long time coherence is actually quite good. Um, um, so this is nice. Um, and what we're interested in now first is to study uh, how well we can basically make atoms interact and generate entanglement between these. So in the simplest case, it's really two atoms. And uh, to really study this, what we do is we uh, assemble atoms into pairs where atoms within a pair strongly interact and then atoms between pairs are basically non-interacting. So we get a bunch of copies of a, of a pair system. So the physics of a pair is relatively simple to explain in terms of an energy diagram. If you're far away, the splitting between the ground state and the first excited state and this doubly excited state is the same and you get basically resonant Rabi oscillations. Now, if you go to close spacings, this doubly excited state with two Rydberg atoms uh, shifts with a one over a six. This is this strong induced dipole-dipole interaction. And if the shift is much stronger than the Rabi frequency broadening that you have, you can basically forget about this level, so you can eliminate it. And you are uh, back to a system that has only three levels, and because of symmetries, actually, the Hamiltonian only couples to superposition state of G and R, and that's actually a Bell state, and you should basically see an uh, oscillation from a GG state to this Bell state, uh, and if you do it carefully, uh, you should also see an, uh, an enhancement of this Rabi frequency by a square root of two. And this is what we see in experiment. So again, we see a textbook Rabi oscillation, and we also see that factor of square root of two. Uh, we can also look at long time coherence here, and we see quite a few oscillations actually here. And I should say this is the first Rydberg blockade. So this is this effect here where you're blockaded for the RR uh, with alkaline earth atoms and, and for the experts in, in, in quantum computing. If you look at Bell state fidelities that you can uh, get from these curves by a lower bounding procedure, uh, you would see that you have a little bit more than 98% if you don't correct for a state preparation measurement error and a little bit more than 99% if you correct for that. We think we can actually push this to another nine uh, with, with some effort in the upcoming. Um, so this is important to have these high fidelities now for quantum simulation, as I will show you in a second. Also, eventually for quantum information and gates. So this is an outlook in a sense. And also, in principle, you could use Rydberg, and I'll show this in the end, to generate entanglement on the clock transition for quantum metrology purposes. These are some sort of the, the directions. And these numbers are all important to actually realize these directions with high fidelity. And also, in the end, to really build up entanglement such that we can uh, outperform uh, classical counterparts. Now, um, I want to show some preliminary results for quantum simulations, uh, quantum simulation with alkaline earth atoms uh, based on these schemes. Um, so uh, we do atom by atom assembly currently in 1D at Caltech and 
you know, on a good day, we achieve about 60 atoms with reasonable fidelity currently, with Twisa array about 100. Um, and now we can do uh, various experiments, and the experiments uh, we have studied the most are simple quench experiments, where all atoms start in G, that's on the ground state, and then you do a quench, so you suddenly switch on the Hamiltonian uh, to a certain parameter set of omega, delta, and interaction strings. Okay. And now, this, as I mentioned, this Hamiltonian is very rich, uh, so you can tune it uh, in different regimes. And the first thing we did was to tune it to a regime where we expect integrable dynamics. Uh, so here's a typical data set. So an integrable dynamics means you should have quasi-particles uh, moving in that system that are basically non-interacting. And that non-interacting quasi-particle spread should lead to a light cone behavior in two-point correlation functions. So here it's plotted a two-point correlation function as a function of distance and time. And you see a build-up that follows this light cone behavior. So in particular, at a given distance, say 10, I have to wait a certain time, 0.5 microseconds, before I see the first correlation signal that's mediated by these quasi particles. And you see, really, with the same scaling here, uh, that experiment and simulation overlap actually uh, quite nicely. Um, so this is a first nice test in actually checking how far uh, correlations can spread in the system. Um, then also with a different set of parameters of omega, delta, and V here, we can tune it to a chaotic regime. And for the expert in a chaotic regime, what you would expect is that the system after a certain time, it basically thermalizes locally, such that the reduced density operator looks like a thermal ensemble. And we observe this here with a simple observable that thermalizes pretty much exactly exactly to the value that we expect from a thermal example. So this is nice. Um, on the way through thermalizations, so you have a few oscillations. And what I want to point out here is that the experiment, these are the black dots, uh, reproduce pretty subtle features of the theory here, actually, to a quite nice uh, degree. And we're really happy to see that. Um, so this is all interesting physics that we will study f further eventually. Uh, what I want to mention here is, as a take-home manager is that we see good agreement uh, with numerics for few body observables. And I say, should say when I say numerics here, I mean exact diagonalization. So we just basically use that Hamiltonian and do the numerics without taking into account error sources. So these are all predictions for purely coherent dynamics. Uh, however, what's really interesting in the context of, of many of these things is to ask uh, what is the fidelity of this on a global level? And what do I mean with that? I mean the following. So we do this quench. Uh, where we evolve uh, the quantum system with the Hamiltonian. And in theory, you would expect a certain target state psi. In experiment, you have a state rho that is mixed from decoherence. And what you're interested in is on a global level, the fidelity overlap, that psi, rho, psi. So how well uh, am I doing in basically generating a state psi that I, that I try to target from theory? And now, that's a, a not an easy problem to measure that overlap, but there has been some progress from various different groups. I want to highlight the results from Peter Zoller and, and Blood Group in Innsbruck, who have a specific scheme to do something like this. And also uh, the Google results. So in their supremacy paper, they use a specific scheme to measure fidelity overlap in very deep random circuits. So we were inspired by these results to develop a scheme for quantum simulators that works as a function of time, even for shallow systems. Uh, and in particular, we, we managed in a collaboration with Sun Won Choi to generalize this Google scheme such that it works also for shallow uh, quantum evolution, both for quantum simulators and for random circuits, uh, digital random circuits. And here are some first results. Um, we basically plot this fidelity estimator as a function of quench time. Uh, this is the same data set that I showed previously, previously for this chaotic regime. Uh, black dots are the experimental results for this fidelity estimator. Uh, the blue line is what we expect uh, from an open system dynamics model that tries to predict rho correctly. So this is the black line, uh, the blue line. And then for this uh, open system dynamics model, we not just only have the fidelity estimator, that's the blue line, but also have the true fidelity overlap, that's the, the red line. So and this all agree, which is quite nice. This indicates that this actually uh, can work. And that's something we're currently working on uh, to really extend this to larger system sizes and really explore the parameter regime a little bit better. So I think that's actually quite exciting. So that means now in a quantum simulator, I can tell you what is actually my fidelity in the evolution. Now you can ask, okay, so you have this x axis here, so what does this actually mean? Is what's actually happening on this time scale? And uh, one interesting question is to ask, how much entanglement do you build up? So you can uh, basically take a plot like this, where you have a fidelity curve, say this blue one, and at the same time, plot the entanglement in the target state. So this is the entanglement in psi, 
and I can see entanglement build up. And now I can do various things with that. In particular, I can tell you, okay, at, to really reach saturation and entanglement, uh, I need a time of five. And at that time of five, I have a fidelity of 0.5. These are some sort of numbers I can give you now. On the global system, we also figured out that uh, based on this fidelity overlap, you can actually generate a lower bound for big state entanglement. Uh, I'm not plotting this yet, but in principle, this curve goes up, has a peak, and then goes down again, which is nice. It means there's a certain time scale where you have maximum mixed state entanglement. After that time scale, the system starts to take here again. So these are really things we can really, I think, uh, articulate now and measure now in experiment. So there's a few different applications of this. So one is benchmarking of various quantum devices. I should say the scheme works, uh, we found out for a quite broad range of Hamiltonians uh, that are realized in Rydberg atoms. Uh, uh, various parameter regimes and ion traps, uh, Bose Hubbard systems, and also uh, digital random circuits. You can really measure this fidelity as a function of time, and you can get the entanglement, and then via this, you could really compare different quantum devices in a meaningful fashion, I believe. The other thing is you can estimate parameters in the Hamiltonian. So in particular, if you predict your theory with the wrong Hamiltonian, this curve will go down quite quickly because the fidelity overlap goes down. That means if I vary the... Uh, Hamiltonian parameters in theory, I can check which ones are the ones that best describe my experiment. And lastly, and that's also really interesting, I think, for me, is you can use this to benchmark classical algorithms. So what do I mean with this? If I have an approximate algorithm to predict psi, say matrix product state algorithm, um, you can uh, you will see that depending on how well you do in this approximate algorithm, this curve will go down quicker. So if this state is not uh, precisely predict that this fidelity curve will go uh, quickly down. And now you can plot, for example, the decay time you have in that curve as a function of the bond dimension in matrix product state. So this x-axis, this bond dimension basically quantifies the classical resources you put into predicting psi. And what you see is that you only predict the decay time correctly, and this would be 5 by 5 in that case, if your bond dimension is above a certain threshold. So that means if my bond dimension is not high enough, I'm not good enough to actually benchmark my experiment correctly. And this would be uh, the pathway to really benchmark experiments where I cannot predict psi correctly anymore, also precisely anymore with ED. So I would plot a curve like this where I look at benchmarking as a function of classical resources and check that it converges. Okay, so that's interesting. And for me, really, the goal is to do certified quantum simulations uh, in, in regimes that become increasingly intractable via classical algorithms, really directly compared to the algorithms on a global level and make statements uh, about uh, how far away we are from really outperforming these algorithms uh, systematically. So that's really where we want to go. Here's a summary and an outlook. I talked about atom by atom assembly, tweezer arrays, and Rydberg interactions. I showed you first results for alkaline earth atoms and narrow line cooling in tweezers. I showed you results for very high fidelity imaging and long lifetime. I showed you our scheme for Rydberg control and entanglement. I did not really show the tweezer clock or the clock state control. I didn't have enough time for that. And I showed you some preliminary data for certified quantum simulation. Now, zooming out, there's basically two different transitions, clock ground to Rydberg. This we use mainly for quantum simulation and optimization. Then there's the clock transition. This can be used for clock purposes. And you can also combine it either for purposes of quantum metrology or for quantum computing, where you use this as a long-lived qubit. I should also say there's a substructure here. If you go to fermionic isotopes, uh, where you see nuclear spins that you could also use uh, for metrology or computing purposes. And now zooming out one more time, I think the main take home message is really that these uh, new arrays uh, via atom atom assembly are pretty uh, new tool and, and a new platform that is uh, applicable to many of these of these directions. I talked mainly about. Uh, uh, results in the context of computing simulation and metrology. We also have some proposal work for networks uh, where we think alkaline earth atoms can be used for direct telecom interfaces, which is really quite nice uh, using cavities. Um, so the take home message is really that this is a promising platform for most major applications in quantum science. And for some of them, we really have a state of the art results competitive with all other platforms. And I think one thing that's really exciting about it is that's really early days. So we really started with the stuff in 2015, 2016 to get these large scale arrays. And, and a lot of technical things and a lot of conceptual things are really unexplored. This makes it uh, so fun. And with this, I would like to uh, thank you all for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Manu. And uh, we we are all run all our time. I think only one question. There's a question from the audience, and that's the movement of the tweezer. 
will increase the temperature of the atoms and uh, decrease the coherence time. Uh, yeah, but usually we cool during the transport and after the transport. Yeah. So usually we have a last cooling stage after the transport. Okay. <clears throat> What's wrong? Oh, trouble. Okay. Any more questions? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, oh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, what about the scaling? Uh, if you turn to the alkali Earth atoms, compare with the alkali atoms. Uh, in terms of system size, yeah, that's a good question. So um, I I'm not sure if I can answer that question yet. So it's um, more complex, and the yeah. reason for that is that uh, we found that in alkaline Earth atoms, to do the uh, imaging right, at least for strontium, you need. Uh, I'm not sure, but we found that it works best with H13 which is yes. the, the clock magic wavelengths and has specific, pro you can do this narrow line cooling. Mm -hmm. uh, we used 515 in the beginning and 515, it turns out there's a leakage state from the this 30 megahertz transition and leakage state is anti-trapped and you lose the atom. So that reduces your fatality a little bit. Now, um, uh, this 813, you have a limited amount of power. You cannot go to infinite power. Uh, what could work is 1064, where you have a lot of power. This is, no one has tried that, and I think this should work. Um, however, this is something we don't know yet. Um, that's true. So in principle, it's a little bit more tricky uh, to scale. Usually, most of the alkali experiments also use 815 or 850 or something like that, but they're a little yeah. bit closer to resonance. That means the polarizability is higher. That means you get more bang for your buck. So it's a little bit more scalable on first glance for alkali, but I don't think that's settled yet. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Manuel. Thank you again. And let's move on.